So I wanted to continue the reading uh, this morning for just a little bit. I was having a hard time with the sermon in part because I understood how these verses continued. It's such a happy ending where we cut it off at verse 21. Everything's great. Everything's just fantastic at the synagogue with Jesus in Nazareth hanging out with folks. But I know that that's not how the story proceeds. In fact, it changes very quickly, and it feels somewhat disingenuous to not continue the story for a little while. So I'm going to read the next uh, several verses. He rolled up the scroll. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and they began He began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. There are also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. None of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Not quite the... uh, Kumbaya ending that we heard earlier in verse 21. Now, if there's a PhD dissertation that I would like to read, it's this. And if anyone at Union is uh, working on this, please let me know. That is the interface between modern American culture and Larry David. I do not think that there is anyone, at least that I know of, that is better at holding up the bizarreness of modern American life than Larry David. Some of you may have seen his show, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Some uh, aspects of the show are essentially this, that he is serious, deadly serious, in fact, about nothing particularly important. His show takes place in Southern California, so a shortcut through the valley is a closely held secret that you must guard with your life. The rules and etiquette about who gets the last bottle of sparkling water in the refrigerator or who should sit at the middle of a table at a dinner party are all deeply serious subjects. But when Larry is running late to speak at a funeral, he turns around with a shrug because he's caught in traffic. When he's asked to do something meaningful for somebody else, he resists or just gives a, eh. And that's sometimes how it is with us, whether we want to admit it or not. We bicker over small things, unimportant things, the etiquette over your fantasy football league, or whether someone else has got 11 items in the 10 items or less aisle at the grocery store. Who does she think she is? The outrage, and we shrug our shoulders at much larger problems, perhaps because they feel intractable, but nobody will notice, we reason, if we don't personally attempt to solve them. I'm not as bad as that guy, we might say. I know the planet's on fire, but nobody's going to call the police, depending on how much I drive or fly this year. Nobody will make a big deal if my thermostat is set really high in the winter. Besides, I don't own my own personal 747. It's not like that. And you can't care about everything and everyone, we reason. And of course, that's, that's very true. There's a, there's a, a fine line that we all tread some time. We have to be good to ourselves. We have to rest, and that's true. We have to take care of ourselves. We can't be burning ourselves out all the time. There's a fine line between apathy and caring and caring too much. All of that is true. When Jesus reads the scroll in the synagogue, 
He says that he's come to bring good news to the poor and excuse me, proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he stops. He's done at that point. He rolls up the scroll, he puts it away, and he sits down. He doesn't read the next line. He's quoting from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 in the synagogue. And if he were to keep reading, the very next line in Isaiah 61 is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of God. But instead of reading anything about the day of vengeance, he rolls up the scroll And he sits down. We come to learn, of course, that Jesus is one who makes proclamations, all sorts of proclamations in the scriptures about peacemakers being blessed and turning the other cheek. And he is one who is taken to a cross without initiating further violence. He stops short of echoing Isaiah's call for the day of vengeance and instead tells us stories about mercy and lives a life dedicated to nonviolence. And so, shortly thereafter, the reading, Jesus is in the synagogue, and everyone is so proud of him, this being Nazareth, his hometown. And it's all, oh, look at Joseph's kid. He's all grown up now. He's such a blessing. And his mother, oh, she must be so proud. You can almost hear another mother or father sat in the synagogue saying, like, oh, did you hear? He's a really big deal now. He's a really big deal. Look at him go. He's someone about which, about which one might brag a bit. But immediately afterwards, Jesus criticizes the very people who are praising him and bragging about him, saying that they'll reject his teaching. They'll never be able to accept him. It's just the way that it is. It's the way it always has been. Same thing happened to Elijah and Elisha, and so the people, they turn on him. They transition in an instant from pride to rage. They kick him out, call him a bum, drag him to the edge of a cliff. They threaten to end his life. And the scene is so chaotic. The people are so full of rage. Their veins course with vengeance to the degree that Jesus simply slips away in their midst. They have become blind in their rage. And for what? Because he said a few things. He claimed he was going elsewhere. He wasn't sticking around. I think we would understand being disappointed, but enraged. He's no longer welcome in his hometown. He's now an exile. And for what? He said a few things. He just said a few things. Jesus stops short of proclaiming a day of vengeance, and then within five minutes, the people in his own hometown initiate an act of vengeance against him themselves. And in fact, they're so full of rage, they have so collectively lost the plot that he slips away in plain sight. They're so angry, they can't even see what's right in front of them. As Tommy Lee Jones says in the original Men in Black, a person is smart, people are dangerous, panicky animals. The scenes were extraordinary. Shocking, shocking enough to penetrate, I think, our collective apathy last year. People running onto runways. People climbing into military cargo plane wheel wells. Imagine for a moment the desperation that needs to exist in one's life to attempt to climb into the wheel well of a moving plane. I hope you saw the picture on the front of today's bulletin. Hundreds of people being airlifted, standing room only, after far, far more people than the plane is supposed to carry rushed into the hold before it departed. They were planning on taking 350 to 400 people in that hold. Instead, there were 823 people in that C-17 Globemaster. The lieutenant colonel who was the mission commander for the flight, a man named Eric Kutt, said, we have women and children and people's lives at stake. It's not about capacity or rules and regulations. A military man saying it's not about rules anymore. It's about training and directives. 
to make sure we could safely and effectively get that many people out. 823 people inside one plane flown to Qatar before they were transported elsewhere. There were thousands of people in Kabul, thousands of soldiers who attempted to hold the line long enough for thousands of others to leave. It was an unbelievable, desperate time last year. For a period of time, Liberty Village here in New Jersey had a greater population than more than half the towns in our state. More than 11,000 Afghan refugees were living at the makeshift community at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst, where the military attempted to provide housing and food, education and healthcare, while connecting people to resettlement agencies around the United States that would attempt to secure housing in the midst of our own affordable housing crisis and ballooning rental rates in many communities. This all may sound like a news update, something that you might read in the newspaper, but this is what I would like for you to know today. It's been quite challenging, especially over the last three or four weeks while Omicron has been doing its thing in our community. It's been very challenging to effectively communicate with all of you about what's going on, events, prayers, letters, updates happen all the time. They're in our weekly emails, which is becoming almost as dense as a monthly newsletter, and yet there is so much that is not being said. We are remiss in not giving kudos to a person or a team or information about the many good things that are underway or challenges that people are rising to, even as so many of us appear tired or irritable or discouraged. And yet, Church World Service in Jersey City has never been busier as they attempt to resettle hundreds of people from Afghanistan in North New Jersey. Your outreach committee at Union Congregational Church has endeavored to help where possible, even as Omicron has been doing what it does best. They have dispersed, the outreach committee has dispersed recently $5,000 for Church World Service's use in helping resettle folks right now. We've begun to post volunteer opportunities that usually include helping set up apartments for newer arrivals, mostly in the Hackensack area. And we have been posting regularly an Amazon wish list in our bulletins and communications to you so that you can directly purchase an item for an apartment. That means that instead of showing up to an empty apartment in a new country and culture, apartments are being stocked with bedding and utensils, appliances, big and small, so that we can ensure that at least some headaches are removed for people as they enter a new community. You can go to that Amazon wish list and buy items big and small and know that they will be used. Some of us are called to fly C-17 Globemasters carrying 800 people to Qatar. And some of us can fundraise. Some of us can purchase. Some of us can show up. But no matter how old or young, we can buy a can opener or a pillow. Or we can call, respond, and play our part in this enormous incredible resettlement effort that is already underway. And I'd like you to know that Mike Spinella has gone above and beyond. And of course, he isn't looking for this attention. He's not done anything for attention. But I want to simply highlight that one of our own, Mike, has, in the midst of lots of his own busyness, gone out of his way to be helpful to one couple who resettled in Clifton recently and with whom he has been in contact several times. Mike has been trying lately to help the Afghan gentleman, Muhammad sort out social security paperwork so that he can gain employment. All of these small and sometimes challenging tasks add up. It can feel like a mere gesture or a token, except that it isn't a mere gesture or a token when someone arrives in an apartment and finds a pillow to lay their head on, or Mohammed scratches his head trying to figure out how to manage social security bureaucracies, and Mike calls him and listens and understands and vows to help. It's not a token. It's not a gesture. It really matters. Today's scripture invites us in to sit with the congregants listening to Jesus read from the scroll, to imagine ourselves listening and nodding along, 
realizing that he stopped short of reading the entirety of Isaiah 61. He stopped short. He was about to read the verse that proclaims the day of vengeance, a day of reckoning, a day of an eye for an eye, and he stopped short. And you think how lovely, how interesting that he speaks so well and he teaches so well. There are profound implications for not reading that verse about vengeance. And Joseph and Mary, they must be so proud. And then he says... He says to the people gathered there, the very people that are bragging about him and praising him, it's not about you. It's not about you. I have other places to be, other more emergent things to tend to. And so the people become angry, so angry that they are out of their minds. They lose themselves in their anger over something that they didn't really have the right to be angry about. So much so that their behavior becomes irrational groupthink. Humans have been worrying about the wrong kinds of things. Traffic jams through the valley and the last bottle of Perrier and dinner party seating arrangements and some words that aren't even about you, but about which we choose to take offense and about which we choose to stress. We become so worried that human beings have a tendency to suck up all the air in the room from the things that actually matter. We are living in a time, an incredible time in American history, where thousands and thousands and thousands of people have run for their lives from war zones after trying to help the United States. And here they are, right now. And we, beloved community, have a chance to help. Peace be with you.